every corner of our planet, from the deepest trenches of the oceans to the highest peaks of our mountains. Plastic waste knows no boundaries. Its pervasive presence not only poses a threat to wildlife and ecosystems, but also jeopardizes human health and well-being. Plastic pollution knows no border, and neither can our response. By fostering collaboration among nations, we can amplify our impact and achieve meaningful progress on a global scale. Our planet and our future generations depend on it. So let's pioneer the possible. And on that note, it's my great honor to welcome to the podium uh, the co-organizer of this event, Kathleen Rogers, the president of the Earth Day Network. You are welcome, Kathleen. Thank you, uh, Sweden. And before I begin, I just want to draw your attention. Um, in a world kind of gone mad, I think we probably all agree that uh, life's tough out there for all of us in every corner of the planet. I walked in here and saw this photo behind me, which looked real because I didn't have my glasses on. And then I started looking around, and some um, person from the Swedish embassy informed me that this is an exhibit of disabled children with Down syndrome and other disabilities posing for what their dream uh, position would be on the planet, what they wanted to be when they grew up or what they wanted to be now. And when you look at these photos and there's another room, um, it just gives me a lot of hope. So I just want to congratulate Sweden for this extraordinary exhibit of hopefulness. Um, it really hit the mark with me this morning. Um, My organization has been around since 1970. Um, the Dennis Hayes and Gaylord Nelson, a US senator, um, got together and turned what was known as an environmental teach-in to sort of take advantage of the unrest in the world, or in the US, around the Vietnam War and the civil rights movement and the indigenous movement, all of which were happening, happening simultaneously. They got together and created eventually something called Earth Day that brought 20 million people, more than 10% of our population, out on the streets. Um, it still remains the largest non-faith-based event in human history. Um, needless to say, seeing all those people, and the media back then was much smaller, a handful of television stations and fewer newspapers, treated it almost reverentially. They could not believe what happened. And the members of Congress and the president of the time, Nixon, um, became very worried about what they saw. And in quick su succession, they passed laws that were um, focused on human health. Before 1970, it was largely a conservation movement that was focused on national parks and wildlife and hunting. And, uh, but it moved dramatically across this line and became about human health. 150 years of industrial development had left this place trashed. You couldn't see across the street in LA. During rush hour, our rivers were on fire. Children were disabled, birth defects. And so they passed these incredible laws, one right after the next, from 70 to 78, the honeymoon period uh, of the environmental movement. But it spawned environmentalism worldwide and became, it really makes uh, a, sort of a red line where they crossed it. and environment became also about human health, which is, of course, what we're talking about today, among other things when we're talking about plastics. Earth Day created um, a campaign. We have a theme every year, and this one is called Planet Versus Plastics. And we chose that after a lot of deliberation because it is a monumental problem that we all face. Um, we're particularly focused on human health, and we've put out uh, one report. Others are following. The first one is Babies Versus Plastics to show the impact of what's happening to our children, from what they're drinking and eating and how it's being absorbed to the placentas that they were developed in, everything is covered in plastic. And the plastic load that our children uh, have right now in their bodies is much less than what I have because I'm much older. And so um, we're also seeing tracing that projection of what the body load of children and others will be. Um, uh, from plastics in general. Um, as you know, plastics is an incredibly useful material. It has spawned hundreds of billions of dollars in development and money for the fossil fuel industry and plastic developers. 
um, and it has half of our life is built on plastic. So we have to take it seriously. And now we have this great opportunity um, to do something about it in the Plastics Treaty. And we are, um, it is a s slow time at the moment for it, but we have great hope and the people in this room that I've spoken with also have great hope. So I'd like to welcome to the stage our speakers on the panel. If you wanna come up. I mean, you're all mic'd up, right? Yes. Yep. Okay, our first speaker will be Mario Morales Lopez. He is the first secretary of diplomatic career, um, and he is at the Embassy of Panama to the United States, a wonderful country. At the embassy, his portfolio includes education, science, technology, innovation, and he maintains contact and relationships with the Department of State and federal agencies, including NASA, NSF, NOAA, as well as universities and organizations such as the Group on Earth Observations. He's had many different jobs in his wonderful career with Panama and also worked um, in the private sector. Um, I'd like to welcome you to speak, and you can stay, stay where you are. If you want to go to the podium, you can. Whatever you prefer. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, first, apologize from Ambassador Martinez that he is feeling sick since yesterday. Maybe the spring is coming. <laughs> Okay, for, for Panama, it's an honor and pleasure to participate in this event. Uh, Panama is a carbon-negative uh, country, and the binomial from plastic and human health is very critical for us. We are declared 54% uh, of marine territory as marine protected area, and the plastic is one of the uh, biggest uh, issue in, con in, in pollution of our sea. For Panama, uh, the sea is source of uh, life, economic resources. Um, so we are decided to participate, it's a commitment of country to participate in all initiative to get a, a, a binding legal instrument uh, in fight to plastic pollution. And today we can, we hope, to explain a little more about the action of Panama in this respect. Thank you. So our other three panelists, if you can also speak about five minutes, we have a really tough five minute timekeeper over there. <laughs> um, the next speaker is Manuel Carmona. You're about the deputy head of section for global issues and innovation and counselor for environment and oceans delegation of the European Union to the United States. Um, he manages relationships between the European Union and the U.S. on issues r ranging from nature conservation to pollution, circular economy, very big these days, plastics, oceans, and fisheries, and has multiple degrees um, from the University of Leicester. Uh, previously worked at the European Commission on other areas, including UNFCCC negotiations, uh, which we're very happy for, and uh, the links between ocean and environmental issues. Thank you. Uh, do you hear me well? Yes? yes. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming in, in spite of the total eclipse. There is a major attraction today. So, uh, so you haven't traveled, you're here, and I'm glad that, that you are here. We're going to talk about plastics. Um, but why is plastics a big deal? Well, since the 50s, I think the figure is around 8.6 uh, billion, billion with B, tons of plastics that we have produced in this world. 60% of those uh, have ended up in landfills or have ended up worse even in, uh, in the environment, in our oceans, in the waterways, uh, in land, they are everywhere. Um, 8.6 billion tons, we're talking about, I made the calculations this morning, you know, kind of nerd, uh, you know, comparing weights, 90 aircraft, aircraft uh, carriers uh, that we put out there. Plastic is pretty light, I mean, if you compare with glass, glass is, is pretty heavy. Plastic is light. You put plastic in the, in the proportion of 90 aircraft carriers, it's quite a lot of stuff. Um, anyway, it's not only that, it's also transboundary. And that is where a global plastic be, be, becomes absolutely necessary. Because this cannot be handled by a country alone. In the European Union, we have a lot of experience on these you know, scaling up policies. 
uh, so that you know, a specific European country cannot solve many problems is at the heart of what the European Union is. We get together 27 countries and we work together to solve issues that cross borders inevitably as part also of a single market. Um, so the market and environment policies are very much linked. Um, and in circular economy and plastics, this is particularly evident. Anyway, so for us, the plastics agreement has become a priority. Priority, I would say, I wouldn't say number one because there are many, but it's a priority certainly in the environmental field. Now why is that? It's polluting everything all over the world. Now they found microplastics in clouds. We were hearing about health issues that are exploding. You know, the knowledge that we have about accumulation of microplastics in our brains, in placentas, and all our tissues. We certainly don't want that. You know, the idea of having little particles accumulating rapidly in our tissues. So for us, it's a priority. The global treaty for us should aim at ending plastic pollution, not necessarily ending plastic. And there, you know, we talk more about use of plastic rather than material, demonizer material. Material has its uses and will always have its uses, like in, medical, uh, uh, in the medical field. But certainly some of the uses of plastics are absurd and noxious to, to human health. And those certainly need to be tackled urgently. We need to tackle plastic pollution from a life cycle perspective, and that means looking upstream as well as downstream. So far, uh, the world, I would say, uh, is looking or has looked more into downstream recycling, waste management. We need to look at the production. We need to look at the design. We need to look at all these stages. This, be this is where complexity comes in on one hand, but where solutions need to be found. We cannot ignore the fact that you know, the design of a product carries with it 80% of the environmental impact. Uh, you know, it ha we have to be tackled at source. Um, Another important element in the EU's position in the Global Plastics Agreement, apart from this life cycle uh, uh, element, is that we need obligations that are global, combined as well with national action. As to how this is going to unfold, uh, that's one of the core issues that we have open in the, in the negotiations. But certainly we do want to see, for example, in plastic production caps, a cap that is obligatory uh, uh, for the world. Uh, we need to reduce this absurd amount of plastic production. The trends are doubling and tripling in 15 years. This is not tenable. <laughs> and I'm going to end there. Uh, sorry, just, just go on. I, know I can't go on and on. I'm sorry about that. Uh, yeah, yeah. She's like, um, we uh, prioritize also connection with SDGs. For example, 12, 13, 14, 15, life on land, life, on, life on, uh, uh, below the sea, sustainable production and consumption. It's important, this connection, because it's part of our whole. And we absolutely want to have this finished by 2024, end of this year, uh, uh, as much as others uh, around the table. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deepor Okusaga. He is the head of energy, climate, and program management for the British Embassy. Um, he ha is a British diplomat focusing on energy, climate, and serves as a head of energy and climate at the British Embassy in DC. Prior to his posting here, he held positions as head of energy and climate, Middle East and North Africa at the UK government's Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, where he focused on energy security and the energy transition in the MENA area. So welcome. Great, thank you very much. So um, I'll cut part of my speech short. Um, I think you've given quite a lot of the background on um, where we are currently with the plastic problem. But the UK has tried to be a leading voice in this avenue. When Rwanda and Peru came up with the proposal, the UK was proud to be a co-sponsor um, of um, the move forward at the UN Environment Assembly in February 2022. Um, as, long, as well with our EU partners and other high ambition colleagues, the UK stands as one of the founding members of the High Ambition Coalition, which is a couple of countries coming together to actually make sure we can push as much as possible to get the best treaty possible and also get to a point by, by 2040. We'll be in a place where we have you know, um, strong targets to ensure that you know, plastic pollution is reduced. So UK position to date, we support and are pushing as much as possible for a very ambitious agreement that covers the whole life cycle of plastics from the beginning of production all the way to recycling. And we want this treaty to actually be the um, standing force that actually moves to end 
or reduce plastic as much as possible. We um, believe in terms of should this be legally binding, we want to have an overarching high level international goal, but we really want to keep on pushing for individual countries to have similar nationally determined positions in which they would come in and then work together to do what they can to achieve this high level goal. So countries like the UK who can move faster than others, we can take a step, in, um, a step forward and deliver, while other countries can have what their country can do to move forward. In line with the um, EU as we um, discussed um, production, we want to ensure that production is reduced to as much as feasible. The UK supports um, national targets on production also, bottom up from um, individual countries and actually rolling that up. At the moment, we are also thinking quite heavily on the just energy transition for um, colleagues in the less developed countries who are doing a lot of work in this. And we really need to make in this INC4 negotiations um, quite a lot of progress in ensuring that we have the just energy trans um, just transition um, in line with ILO guidelines um, at the foundation of what we do. And we generally believe finance is needed hopefully we get to a point where we can have a global multilateral um, agreement, um, hopefully through the global environmental facility, and we can kind of work together to kind of put as much finance as possible to ensure we can transition. So at the moment, we have um, at INC4, we have quite INC123, quite a long treaty, about 70 pages. We need to cut it down. We need to be more concise um, at the upcoming um, negotiations, we want to focus on getting the objectives of the treaty as concise as possible. We want to focus heavily on um, going on problematic plastic products. We want to ensure we focus on product design performance of plastics. We want to ensure that we look at pollution from fishing and aquaculture gear. And also, it's really important that we live here and by, we go, by the time we get to November, at the end of this year, have gotten to a place where we have a whole life cycle plastic treaty that takes into consideration individual country circumstances and we can actually work to deliver. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rob Wing, who's Deputy Director of the Environmental Policy Office at U.S. Department of State. Um, he is in the state in his Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs, OES. Um, he works to coordinate development of U.S. foreign policy on a broad range of environmental issues, um, and those include air quality, chemicals, and waste management, U.S. engagement with multilateral environmental organizations, and trade-related environmental cooperation. Prior to joining OES, Mr. Wing spent nine years working at EPA in their Office of General Counsel, there, he served as the primary staff attorney on domestic and international pesticide and toxic chemical initiatives. Rob, welcome. Great. Thank you so much. And it's such an honor to be here. I'm, I actually feel a little bit like I'm coming home here. My husband's family has a restaurant in Stockholm. And I've spent many, 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 many times. I've been in Stockholm many times, probably more than 20 times. And I've spent a lot of time in this embassy. And you're right. The embassy does put on these amazing um, these amazing um, art installations um, on a regular basis, and so it's really nice to be back. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really honored. Um, and it's really important for us to hear, it's also just really important for us to hear from civil society, hear from all of you about the, the, you know, about the negotiation and, and, and to get your input and to consult with you on where we should be headed in these negotiations. Um, and it's important to compare notes. I feel like if we, the, the, the four of us in the room here, can sit down and negotiate this agreement, we, we might get to uh, 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 an endpoint um, in, in a pretty quick, in a pretty quick time frame. I almost, w I almost could say ditto to everything that you guys said, almost, almost. So, um, <laughs> it's the almost that matters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Biden-Harris administration is committed to implementing policies that will reduce plastic pollution significantly. At the State Department, we approach this from this issue from the global perspective by working on three avenues of action: advancing the international negotiation around the global agreement on plastic pollution, um, um, stakeholder engagement, and establishing a multi-stakeholder forum to support projects and exchange ideas to address pollution at all stages of the plastics life cycle. 
one of the, you know, really one of the biggest obstacles um, to reaching agreement, I think, on the global level is um, is the is to ensure that we bri we need to bridge differences um, between countries with opposing positions um, and keep the negotiations constructive on track to reach consensus with all members to garner support for the international agreement. There's really a lot of differences now, and we really need to work to bridge those differences to get to a sex successful outcome. We have been engaging with civil society, industry, the science community, state and local governments, and tribal nations to take into account their perspectives in formulating our approach. Beyond the negotiations, the United States is spearheading the um, End Plastic Pollution International Collaborative, or EPIC, which convenes public and private sector partners to spur global multi-stakeholder action that will tac tac tackle plastic pollution head on. EPIC is a public-private partnership led by the United States with membership from a number of NGOs and other countries in the private sector. Um, and um, it's aimed at utilizing the latest technologies and scientific approaches to reducing plastic waste as well as creating a forum for stakeholders to exchange knowledge and information and best practices. If I have time, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. I have two minutes left? Okay. <laughs> so now I'll talk a little bit more about our negotiations. Um, we seek an ambitious and inclusive global agreement on plastic pollution with meaningful and feasible universal obligations and flexibilities for parties to prioritize their most pressing problems. Parties should reduce plastic pollution throughout the life cycle of plastics from upstream to downstream. National action plans should outline how a party will implement obligations and facilitate reporting. Systemic change is needed with countries working together to take action throughout the full life cycle of plastics, including product design, waste management. Waste management and recycling alone are not enough to address this global problem. The successes of the future instrument will determine not only what it says, but also who it includes. The agreement should have universal membership, including every country that is a major producer uh, or consumer of plastic. This includes the United States, because we are a part of the problem and we must be part of the solution. The US is committed to working to finalize the text by the end of 2024. I'm glad that we've all agreed on that. We want an instrument that the United States and other major producers and consumers can join. We will not be able to achieve success unless we all, national and subnational governments, the private sector, civil society, indigenous communities, academics, and other citizens work together. And agreeing, agreeing, as I said earlier, agreeing on the final text will be challenging. There's a wide spectrum of views on how, on how to be ambitious in combating plastic pollution. And I want to say, I think we all have the same ambition. We want to end plastic pollution. That's our ambition. And you know, I think the issue is figuring out how we're how we're gonna how we're gonna get there and what we need to do now. Um, um, and but we need to start. Um, so agreeing on the final text will be challenging. Um, there's a wide spectrum of views, ranging from bottom-up voluntary approaches to hard, to hard obligations on eliminating or reducing problematic polymers, chemicals, and additives, and banning products. At INC4, we will need to make progress towards converging on the elements of the instrument. This will include the members finding a way to refine streamline, and streamline the options where they do not have agreement. The most important, one of the most important decisions of INC4 will be agreeing on intercessional work. We can't just do this during the INCs. We've got to work in the middle of the INCs too to, so that when we get to INC5, we're in a place to really reach agreement on the final text. Um, we expect to play an important role in the US on building bridges um, between different country approaches. And um, we're looking forward to, to um, I'm looking forward to having, answering any questions. So maybe I'll stop there. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. So the way this works, I have four questions that we developed, um, and then we'll open it to the floor. So I think the first one, and you can all answer, you can choose not to answer, but I hope you all will say something about these. Um, we all know from recent studies that plastic recycling as a solution to the crisis has been totally and widely discredited by an industry that spent decades having us believe that it worked. At most, five to eight percent of plastics can be recycled. At the same time, we've learned that microplastics and additive chemicals used to make them are associated with a wide range of human health issues, from Alzheimer's to autism, cancer, particularly in people under 40, childhood development issues, heart disease, strokes, so is this treaty um, at its heart a plastic waste issue or a human health issue, or is it both? And how strongly should the treaty address 
human health issues specifically, and is that realistic? Who wants to go first? Rob. Rob. I, well, I think it's both. I mean, we, we, support, uh, we support an objective in the treaty that is, protects human, the he human health and the environment from plastic pollution. I mean, you really need to address both parts of it. It's not, it's not an either or, it's not an either or, either or issue. You need to focus on human health and the environment, and that's what we're supporting. We're supporting an objective that, that does both. Simple. I'll just stop there. Simple. Yeah. I think from um, the UK position, you know, we are looking at it from human health and also um, 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 view. But one of the main things we want to push as much as possible is actually building that evidence gap. And you know, loads of people are making um, um, a lot of statements based on fact, but we need to really do a lot more to actually make sure that as we speak and you know, link cancer, Alzheimer's and other um, illnesses to plastics. We have the most um, you know, research behind that. So the UK is looking to work with like-minded countries to actually you know, investigate this so that we can put um, the information um, out there as much as possible. You know, we, are, we support you know, um, actually, so still actually supports a secular economy way. So as well as re um, um, doing a lot of research, we at the moment feel that we should continue to push countries to be as secular as possible with their production. And not only um, you know, recycle, but try as much as possible to reduce and, um, and um, eliminate as much as possible the production of plastics. So that is where we are at the moment. A lot of work on you know, secular economy of plastics, but quite a lot of work on the evidence gap and making sure we're actually supporting as much as possible the research behind it. So when we make uh, we have, we have conversations and we say, you know, plastic causes X or Y, we have a robust scientific database behind that that can show the link. Yes, about the problem of waste or human health, we consider that it's both. And related to the strong of 3D of plastic, we consider that the treaty of plastic must be as strong as the prevention Pan, pan, pandemic Prevention Treaty that is in negotiation right now in the uh, World, organization, World Health Organization. Um, and the last pandemic showed the vulnerability of the human to uh, health risk. But in the case of COVID-19, the COVID was a surprise. The COVID was a virus. And finally, we can overcome using vaccine. But in the case of diseases caused by plastic, we can get out with vaccine. We need strong action to mitigate and stop the plastic pollution in all areas. We consider um, Panama support a uh, dividing instrument uh, in all uh, aspects. It's, I think, health. I mean, this is, um, I think it's both a waste and a health problem indeed. Um, but generally, it's just, you know, um, environment and health are, are kind of the same thing, right? Uh, we have in Europe um, developed the concept of, you know, it's not Europe that has developed it, but we have certainly embraced it uh, of uh, one health. I mean, whatever damages our environment, it will end up damaging us. I mean, this is, you know, um, clear. So um, using the planet as a toilet, uh, the way we're doing it right now, like throwing everything out there, you know, um, generally uh, is going to come back to, to haunt us. In this context of the Global Plastics Agreement, we got the, what they call the substances of concern. These are toxic additives. Some have estimated around 13,000 of them in, in plastic production nowadays because, you know, they perform in a different way, so you adapt the polymers of plastics to different uses uh, that are interesting. There's not much transparency of those, and I think the Global Plastics Agreement needs certainly to at least, at least achieve transparency worldwide. These are toxins flowing all over the planet in the part of the global trade, and finally entering our bodies in the, in the form of microplastics. Uh, we don't know much about it, so transparency is going to be crucial. But there are ways, I mean, the good news is there are ways to, to, to do this. In the Circular Economy Action Plan that we have in Europe and in the legislation that we've been putting together, uh, for example, um, the eco-design, the, um, uh, the um, packaging waste directive, um, many other uh, legal instruments, 
we're trying to develop the, what they call the digital uh, passport, digital product passport, where you would have, you know, uh, you know, in digital form, all the elements, all the com composing toxic additives or whatever that are in a product, and everybody in the value chain would have access to that. Of course, you have to kind of articulate that with uh, privacy. You have to articulate that with commercial secrets as well. Uh, so it's not as easy as it sounds, like we put everything in a, in, a, in a digital format that can be read easily. But this is where we're going uh, in, in, you know, in search of transparency. And then tackling also the, the toxic additives. Some of, the, some of them will need to be phased out, as simple as that, banned, and hopefully in a global way, so they don't end up being in the, in the global trade. Uh, this could be an annex to the treaty, for example. This could be criteria that identify at a later stage what are those additives. So there are certain possibilities, but certainly this is a top issue for the EU um, to tackle the, the substance of, of substances of concern. Yeah. Thank you. So I think this is a civil society question because there are many members of the uh, general public and civil society groups um, that really want to understand this. Why have world governments allowed so much power to be given to the petrochemical industry in these negotiations? And People have seen the pictures where oil producing countries are huddled with the petrochemical industry during these negotiations. Why are they allowed to participate at the same level or even higher than civil society uh, members who are representing the people who are most affected, although we all are, by the dangers of plastic? How can we make that um, civil society on an even playing ground, uh, playing field with the petrochemical industry? I can start. Um so these conversations and participation in multilateral negotiations has been quite a topical issue. Um, we saw the same thing at COP28 with a petrol states hosting it and you know, loads of people were upset about you know, why do they have a seat at the table, why do they get to make the decisions if they cause all the problems. But we were able to get quite, like the that was this last COP on, on energy and climate was the first time we got fossil fuels in the text. And I don't think if we didn't have um, a fossil fuel con um, CEO leading it, we would have been able to make such progress. Um, so in my opinion, and the UK opi opinion, participation is key. Civil society is very, very, very important. But also, we can't make these decisions without having the people who we would force or make to make these updates and changes. They need to be on the table. They need to be able to speak to us. And you know, as we come up with ideas, they need to explain what is deliverable, what is not deliverable. So we want an ambitious decision. We're quite keen that we are as transparent as possible, inclusive as possible, and make sure that we have both civil society, the business community in the rooms. But just to kind of be very clear, the INC process, the negotiations themselves, are happening with countries. So, you know, we consult widely, but only member countries are negotiating. And so the main work is being done country to country, but generally we consult widely, as everybody would expect us to do, um, with yourselves, with people who are within the whole life cycle and the whole value chain. Petrochemical Corporation, uh, as generator of employment and economical growth, uh, put in the negotiation table but not as a more important actor, obviously. Um, I think that every actor in the negotiation must uh, operate in equal condition. And the civil society role is very important. But the key point maybe is get a consensus because every day the awareness about sustainability and environmental responsibility is greater. And petrochemical industry is taking note about that. Um, civil society is best, uh, better organized and work better in negotiation. Um, today, we have enough technology to make pro plastic products uh, using a better process that generate less pollution, and we can get benefit about the plastic. We, we can forget about plastic whole. We need to understand the necessity to improve the technology in the process of production of plastic and recycling. And civil society must continue uh, alerting the whole humanity about the necessity to 
create better condition for everybody. In the, in the mission that we can get, uh, get an agreement between the necessity of conserve the environment for all the planet and don't use it as a toilet, and the private sector understand that with better technology, continue making money and keeping safe the planet, we can continue uh, in good way for negotiation. Yeah, thank you. Um, I kind of just want to say ditto to what he said, but um, no, <laughs> um, no, I want to start by saying that these are government to government negotiations. It's governments talking to governments and governments need to come together as governments and reach consensus on the final text of the agreement by, by the end of 2024. Then governments need to sign the agreement when we have the, the, the meeting of plenipotentiaries and then governments will need to join it so it can enter in divorce. So it's a government negotiation, government to government. And then, but stakeholder engagement, as everybody said, and stakeholder consultation is incredibly important. It's gonna take all of society to solve this problem. So we really need to bring all of society in to make sure that all of society is working together to solve this problem. And not one group has more strength or more power than another group in these negotiations. That's just not true, and at least in my experience and what I've witnessed. All, all, we're listening to all groups. I know that's true from the US perspective. We have, we have stakeholder meetings. We have big stakeholder um, group meetings. They're all inclusive, and then we meet with subsectors of stakeholder groups. and. You know, we meet with individual stakeholders. We, we really want everybody to be involved. We've had industry group stakeholder meetings. We've had environmental group stakeholder meetings. We've had stakeholder meetings with subnational and national and subnational or subnational and local governments. We've had stakeholder meetings with tribal groups. We really need to bring everybody on board and we really need to be, have everybody part of the solution. And that's really what we're trying to do. Um, I just can't stress enough that it's how important it is to bring everybody to the table and make sure that everybody is being heard, because that's the only way we're going to solve this problem. I, I, I think um, you mentioned something interesting uh, there, Rob, uh, the fact that we have consultations at home before we go to these negotiations, all these consultations where, you know, we hear everybody. I think turning the question upside down a bit, um, I wonder whether rather than excluding from, you know, from being present at these negotiations, which, you know, might be counterproductive. I think, you, you know, you, you kind of demonize people. They are not involved and the enforcement becomes a problem because, of course, you know, they don't feel that they are, they've been heard. So that can be tricky. I would turn the tables and think, well, in these national processes, uh, can we involve at the same table private sector, NGO, civil society, and having them when the administrations call them to, to get feedback, having them sitting at the same table and also talk to each other. I think that's crucial. And in the structures that we use for these consultations, I think there's margin for improvement. Uh, I don't know so much in the US, certainly, you, to, you know, to actually um, hear everything at the same time. Um, so they are obliged to confront each other in front of the you know, uh, policymakers, those governments that will be representing a, a position on behalf of, of countries. And I agree, this is a country to country negotiation that is happening. So I would, I would look back at the, actually, in the earlier stage. Um, now, another point I want to uh, mention is because I've been dealing with climate negotiations as well, is that these petrochemicals and these corporations, uh, of course, they're defending their interest, their interest um, tooth and nail, that's, that's understandable. Now, what they do very well is to work across conventions and across negotiations. And that is something that countries maybe should do better as well. I've been a bit self-critical here. I'm gonna put an example there to you. Probably you, you've heard it before. In COP28, you had this you know, uh, uh, phasing out of uh, transitioning away from fossil fuels, and that's very nice. But then you have a little thing afterwards, fossil fuels used in the energy sector. So, you know, you talk to colleagues in the climate negotiation, this is very good results, Edra, but wait a minute, what's this energy sector thing? This energy sector means that, you know, that you're not gonna to touch on petrochemicals, so the production trends for plastics are not covered by that, essentially. So, were those in the climate negotiations aware of the significance of that for other major environmental problems? Because they're linked. And many corporations have the capacity to link these negotiations. And their guys know, okay, here, there, okay, there, I'm going the same thing. 
we need to align also as countries uh, to tackle these, these problems together. I think that's crucial. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> um, a lot of people feel that progress wasn't made in the first three inks. Um, so if ink four, and I happen to read the treaty over weekend, it was a very exciting weekend, um, <laughs> all the options and it was impossible to figure out if you picked option one, would you pick option one all the way through? And it was, it was let's call it complicated. Um, so if, if we fail to make progress in ink four, um, and remember 50% of all plastics is single use, so they could make real reductions if there's the will to do it. What do you all think is the next step after that? I mean, all of us want to reach that end goal by the end of 2024. Rob, you want to start this sure. time? Yeah. Well, first, I, I think we did make progress. We have made progress. We did make progress at INC3. We actually now have that 75-page text, and it's all bracketed, but we have it, and that's progress. Um, it was hard to get there. Um, during INC2, there was um, a lot of consternation that the zero draft text didn't include the views of all countries. And so we spent a lot of time making sure that you know, we got all views in so that we could start in INC4 at a, you know, at a place where we had a, had a common text that we could work from. And so I think we have made progress. And I think we, our goal is to continue to make progress at INC4. I think I've talked about that a little bit already. I think we need to, we need to narrow down. We need to <laughs> make that text smaller. We need to narrow down our differences. We really need to narrow them down to the few key differences that we can make um, progress, that we can, you know, that are the most you know, contentious, where there's the most disagreement. And then from there, we need to, we need to go into the intercessional period. We need to work in the intercessional period to try and find solutions, creative solutions, to where we have differences so that when we get to INC5, we can reach an agreement. And that's really crucial. We're really, really committed to doing that. We think that, that now is the time, and we need, to, we need to reach consensus on this text by the end of 2024. And you know, I'm hopeful that we'll get there. I mean, I think everybody is committed to getting there. So. You want to go? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I cannot agree more. But for that, we're going to need serious intercessional work. I think what's been missing here and why, um, yes, we have achieved, but, but we're certainly late. I mean, I'm not going to hide that from you. I think uh, there's, there's much to do because this is when the, the, uh, the push comes to shove, really, the nitty gritty of the details. Um, there are big details, you know. We're talking about substances of concern. We're talking about human health. We're talking about uses that are absurd of, of, of plastic, you know, like, like cutlery, you know, stuff like that, that we have banned in the EU uh, in 2021, by the way. All this stuff uh, needs to come together uh, with experts talking frankly uh, about them and, and bringing up solutions, cutting down on the text and choosing options. This needs to be part of intersessional work. And the fact that we haven't had intersessional work is showing up now as a big as a big delay, uh, we cannot delay that anymore. I think the EU is going to be, is going to be very uh, adamant that uh, from now on until the fifth uh, inter intergovernmental negotiating committee, we need that intercessional work. That's that's uh, clear. We think that we are optimistic about the next negotiation. Uh, we believe that the all party involved have the enough scientific evidence and economic understanding that we can and we need uh, make an agreement and binding instrument because it's possible to um, keep safe the planet and um, making industry working because we need the industry. And after three uh, negotiations before, I think this is it. it, it the time is now. Uh, the planet, the human health, the one hell can wait for more time. The pollution is a reality. It's not, it's not a fiction. Um, I'm optimistic that uh, in the next negotiation we can get the instrument after the progress in three uh, negotiations before. So um, from the UK's point of view, as similar to the US and the EU, um, 2024 should be our deadline. We're working quite strongly to get all the work finished by then. 
we do think you know loads of progress has been made so far. Um, long text, seven something pages. Um, it's been slow, but we needed to consult and get everyone together. Um, intersessional work, um, technical work in between Inc. Four and Inc. Five is paramount, and we'll be pushing for that. But the UK has done some stuff also. Um, if we don't get intersessional work um, across the line, we, along with Brazil, have actually led an informal technical dialogue on actually the work on plastic, um, problematic plastic products. And we've brought together technical experts together to actually advise and do a lot of work before um, 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 upcoming inks. So if we don't have that mandate and it's not agreed, we do believe we should work with like-minded to actually create informal working groups like the UK Brazil working group to actually make sure that you know we can, with or without um, an agreed intersessional work uh, in between in four and in five, we go with a very strong position with the high ambition countries and also countries that are not there and actually come with a more streamlined um, text that we can kind of push forward. Um, as we um, fi finalize this by the end of 2024. Well, end of 2024 is still the goal and what we're moving towards. Thank you. My last question, and I must admit, it might be in the draft treaty. I fell asleep at about page 6970. Um, um, how seriously are your governments really taking the plastics and human health, and will you push the plastics industry to be made financially responsible for the health crisis pollution pr process uh, uh, pollution uh, from their products are causing. In the U.S., we have principal, oh, I think all the countries here do, of polluter pays. Do you think that will uh, ever be part of the treaty? Okay. Panama recognized the severity of global plastic pollution. And we are working in two sides, in the domestic, in the domestic field and international. For example, at the national level, since approximately 10 years, we are working in making laws about the use of plastic. For example, in 2018, we approved a law that promotes the reusable uh, bags in the commerce and uh, trading uh, sites. We are the second uh, country in Latin America after Chile in adopt this kind of law. Uh, for Panama, it's very important the take action about the plastic pollution because we have 50 percent of a marine protected area and the plastic travel directly to the seas. For Panama the sea important is critical and so we need to protect uh, the sea about uh, against the plastic pollution. Uh, also in the national level in 2020 we approved another law that regulate the reduction and replacement of single-use plastic products. Uh, the cutlery and many other uh, plastic use, and we are take action to uh, reduce and provide some use of these products. And since 2022 to 2027, we approve a, a national marine waste plan uh, with the support of um, international marine organization and the United Nations Environment Program. And we are working to enhancing research, development, and innovation, and mobilizing resources in create action um, from civil society, government, private sector, obviously, to reduce the pollution, uh, marine pollution. Also, Panama have the greater uh, maritime registry in the world. So we are a big responsibility, we have a big responsibility about all vessels that uh, move in the, in the seas. Also in the international field, um, since 2022, we participate in the High Ambition co uh, Coalition, uh, led by Norway and Rwanda. Um, Last month, we received in Panama a delegation from Chile, Colombia, El Salvador, Argentina to take note about the position of Latin America country in the next negotiation in Ottawa. Um, uh, last year, in at the December 2022, uh, sorry, uh, 23, Panama launched a platform, uh, a 
platform where the private sector and government authority and civil society and academia uh, get information about the level of pollution and the way that every actor, civil society, uh, coastal marine community, uh, authorities, and private sector can reduce in his daily activity uh, the, the pollution about plastic. Uh, this platform um, received the support from the United Nations, uh, many international uh, ONGs, and um, Panama never stopped to work in fight about uh, plastic pollution. And the commitment is so strong. We are decide is the position of Panama and many other countries in Latin America to the necessity to get a, a binding agreement this year. Thank you. Like I, I would think in the European Union we are extremely serious about about the global plastics agreement. The resources that we are uh, employing for these negotiations are, are unparalleled uh, for this for this type of, of subject uh, and, and format. We have, of course, 27 member states with their own legislation in certain aspects of that, and we are enriched, actually. We embrace the, the very many solutions that we have in the 27 countries. I want to actually um, acknowledge the role of Sweden, uh, you know, hosting this event, but also because they are part of the Bureau of the negotiations, as well as Estonia. So two of our member states have a, have a key role. The US is also part of the Bureau and others. Um, a key role in the, in the in the negotiations. So you can see we play as EU level, also at EU member state level, uh, and and specifically I want to point at the polluter pays principle. Three very short, very nice words: polluter pays principle. Makes sense. This is in the EU treaties already. For us, it could be easily transported into these negotiations. They should. It should be there. It should be there. Um, in Article 192 of the EU Treaty, you have Peru, the PACE principle. And this is fleshed out in many of the regulations that we have adopted, uh, or we are in the process of adopting at the EU. Right now, as we speak, eco-design, uh, packaging waste directive. Uh, behind all that, even, even a fee, we have a tax, and many people know this, we have an EU-established tax for plastic that is not recycled. If a member state doesn't recycle much, pays more into the coffers of the, of the EU. So we got these elements, you know, that, that flesh out what polluter pays, pays mean, and I think uh, we're going to bring that uh, strongly to the, to the table. So we take this, this challenge very, very seriously. So um, just to uh, um, agree with my colleagues on the panel, um, the UK also agrees with the polluter pays principle. Um, not only um, internationally, but domestically, we have it in law, and we are working by 2025 to actually strengthen our laws within the UK to ensure that we have um, the politics pace principle applied. Um, so in the treaty um, text also, we are pushing for um, the same or similar uh, um, text and to ensure that this goes on and um, politics pays internationally. So um, just to say we agree with that. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, when I hear you ask this question, I hear you talking about extended producer responsibility. And I think probably everyone in the room knows that we don't have national legislation that allow us for allow an, a national extended producer responsibility regime. But a number of states are doing that, and we're hearing calls for more federal involvement in extended producer responsibility. And we're we're hearing those calls, and we're we're really we're taking them seriously. We really agree that we need to be focusing on um, on these issues and how we how we bring the private sector um, into the equation and, and how we can implement. Um, you know, how we can encourage extended producer responsibility, even though we don't have federal legislation to do that. And we think that there are, we, we think there needs to be a, a provisions in the agreement too that, that, that discuss extended producer responsibility, because that's going to be part of the, that's going to be part of the solution. Again, we don't have national legislation around it, but that doesn't mean that we can't do it, we can do nothing. We, we need to, we need to engage in the, in, the, in the federal government level as well on this issue. So. Yeah, and I, we are seeing the industry in a little teeny way, uh, advertising a lot about how they're going to take back every bottle or every bag or whatever it is they're doing, and it's really unrealistic. But 
yep. and a lot of industry being very engaged on this issue, implementing their own extended boost responsibility schemes. And it's not, so it's not just the state and local governments, it's also industry that's implementing their regimes. And, you know, we strongly encourage that. You know, we hope they work. We also encourage these, their separate accountability, they've set up their own sort of accountability systems that are independently ver verified often. And I think that's also important and crucial. So, um, so um, we, we are, we're, you know, we're behind that, so. Right. Well, you've done a great job so far. Okay, now we're, how much time do we have? Anybody know before the next panel starts? Anyway, why don't we try and take at least two questions from the audience? Go ahead, right here. Hi, thanks for doing this. Thank you. I'm Kelly Lunny with Bloomberg Government. I wanted to know where the U.S. stands on uh, production caps on plastics. Um, well, we don't, support, we don't support production caps per se, but we support demand side reduction um, of plastic pollution. We think we, we don't have legislation to support production caps. We want to be part of this treaty. We think we need to be part of the solution. And so we, we're, we, we, and we support reduction in, in production, um, but we don't have legislation that, you know, to support production caps. So. Well, I think there's all sorts of things we can do. We can, you know, government procurement for start starters. We can also, um, we can also, you know, focus on on reuse. We can focus on innovation. One of the things I haven't talked a lot about here is innovation, and I think innovation is a huge part of the answer. And we're spending a lot of money on on innovation and in the innovation space. Innovation in design that we've talked about here and design of products, in innovation in materials use, innov innovation in, in reuse systems and how we do reuse, innovation in waste management. I think, you know, we really, innovation is really gonna be part of the solution here. And, um, and you know, our Department of Energy is doing amazing work in this space that's really hopeful. And so I think, you know, um, and, 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 we, and we have the same ambition. So I think we have the ambition of ending plastic pollution and we need to do it in, 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 through, in a, a way that, you know, is, that works for us legally, but that also has, has impact, that achieves these results. I mean, we all, we all have the same ambition to end plastic pollution. So. Does anybody from, from want to talk about caps on production? Um, I know the question was directed to Rob, but I don't know. No, so I think um, within the UK, um, we want to restrain and reduce the amount of plastic being um, produced to sustainable levels. We want to focus and push more circular economy, but <coughs> we don't support um, caps um, for countries. We want each individual country within this treaty to um, come with what is nationally deliverable and then hopefully have a bottom up. So if a country like the UK or a country can go a bit further, um, we um, say um, we should go more further. And so we are looking for, um, in terms of production caps, um, a bottom up approach rather than this treaty giving a top down um, mandate. Yeah, you like to seen that everything is subject to investigation and prove the viability. If maybe it's possible, um, establish caps, but um, we need a um, necessary story about the, the issue, but it's not impossible yet. Yeah, and I mean, and also look at how long it took how many years it took to get phase out of fossil fuels in a treaty? I mean, like, amazing. Uh, I'm just going to say one, one thing. Uh, I mean, production trends right now are, you know, doubling, tripling by 2040, the, the amount of plastics that we are producing right now in 2024. This is, this is 16 years ago. Uh, sorry, 16 years uh, uh, from now. Eh? 16 years from now, we might end up having twice three times as much production as now. It's just not sustainable. And I don't see a way out of this except, you know, uh, ban phase out certain absurd uses uh, of plastics. In the EU, we have banned 10 uh, plastic uh, uses, plastic objects for which there are inexpensive uh, substitutes. Um, y y you know, uh, one way or another, the supply side needs to come in here. We cannot have three times as much plastic in, in 16 years. Yeah. 
So, sorry, I just want to add. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, one of the other aspects here is that this is one of the most contentious issues in the negotiation. It's one of the hardest parts of the negotiation. And in our view, we need to get to yes here. And so we need to, we need to come up with solutions. That, and we need to be inclusive. We really need the whole world to be involved in this treaty. We need to get all of the nations involved. We need to get the producers. We need to get the consumers. It's going to take everybody to solve the sol solution and solve this. And that's, this is one of the most contentious issues. And so you know, we think we need to be flexible so that we can bring everybody on board and then start and strengthen. Um, you know, that's, I think I heard the ambassador say that in the beginning. And I think that's something that we really support and are on board with. So. Yeah, I mean, even Earth Day, I mean, our theme is that our entire focus is to educate the public because we need everyone. I saw an EU study that said 60 or 70 percent of people from the EU did not know plastics, and I considered a, a t an incredibly informed public, did not know plastics was made out of oil. We have a long way to go. And so we are also here to support and annoy you all. That's our job, and to be tough about things. But we do have a big education um, uh, role ahead of us, all of us do, in order to bring the public. So, And that, in turn, will put more pressure on the negotiations. Um, next question. In front? Yes. This. Oh, oh. sorry. Somebody jumped up. Okay. Sorry. Uh, in the ye yellow. L Lin Linda Molnar, uh, U.S. National Science Foundation. I just wanted to pick up on a couple of things that were mentioned. First, uh, Rob's comments on innovation, right? So as a funder of R&D innovation at NSF, I really see that as part of the solution. And, you know, production caps are, are contentious topic for obvious reasons, right? So is, is there a way to use innovation to innovate to a better place for, for the environment and for human health and, and a way to work together? Because I understand it's a government to government negotiation here, but it's really about the producers and shifting from what they're doing now to a vision for a different future to produce the products that we need to exist it's a modern society that we are. Many of those products, which do contain plastics, you know, um, I wholly agree with what Manuel is saying. Like we've got to get, we've got to get uh, uh, chemicals of, of emerging concern out of these products, right? But isn't that the primary concern with the plastics in our production, right? And also, you know, of course, decreasing production. But you've got to give the industry, I think, somewhere to go. Right? Instead of just taking and saying, okay, we're going to stop production, right? Where can they go towards producing things in a different way? And so then if anyone on the panel can explain, we did mention briefly about government procurement. I think that's another way to come in and governments can really make a difference. So if anyone had more information about the greening government initiative, because I'm, I'm a proponent of circular design and circular economy, and I think that's a way that governments can joined together and they already have done some work to you know, sh make this shift towards a different, different world. OK, how, how do you all respond? We all love innovation, but how realistic is it to match this up in parallel? How, how much work is the industry doing? Are the governments doing? I, if, if I may, I think innovation, just, I'm just going to add one, one note on, on the word innovation. To me, innovation means innovation in technologies, of course, uh, to do things better, but also innovation in policies. Also innovation in business, in business models, business models that might reduce the supply uh, because there's a business opportunity in something that doesn't use plastics. So here, the, 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 the problem also is that uh, for many of these producers, this is a very profitable business. Yeah. So why should I innovate with new uh, business models? Or why should I support innovative policies if what I'm doing is making me rich? Now, uh, and everybody else uh, in trouble. Uh, that's, that's, you know. So, so it, is, it is actually crucial to look not only about technologies, but also, I think, about policies, business model innovation, the incentives to have innovation on those as well. Yeah, I mean, and when you read the Wall Street Journal, which I love to hate, but anyway, um, <laughs> it, it talks about where these stranded, now that you added the words phase out to the climate agreement, they're all looking, they're projecting moving all those stranded potentially stranded assets into plastic. So I, I agree with you. It's 
but on the other hand, I, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. If the treaty is tough, if it could ever be tough, and could add the words phase out, even if it takes a couple years, um, then innovation will follow. But I don't know if you all agree. In the case of Panama, the National Plastic Action Platform is an example uh, from innovation. But this innovation is result the work, the joint work from the academia and scientific community of Panama. That the, the scientific community informed the government, and government opened a dialogue and invited the private sector and civil society and community. And government put the resources, uh, technology resources, and every stakeholder interesting information and create new design about, for example, in the private sector, um, design of manufacturing process uh, related to plastic products. In the education sector, uh, it's very important to uh, create awareness in the, since primary school to the university and postdoctoral study. Um, in the community, it's very important uh, the understanding that the correct management of plastic the recycling process and reduce the use of, 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 of plastic. Uh, and the innovation is possible. And in the, in the way that every stakeholder work together, we can um, get better results, uh, innovating education policies, uh, manufacturing process, uh, also a legislative uh, instrument, law and regulation. Uh, off sure. the top of your head, do you have yeah. any idea how much money? I mean, mm. DOE is unbelievably uh, yeah, well, rich I mean, these days, but how much are they putting into coming I, up with new good substitutes? Question. I don't have a number for you. I don't have a number, but there's a lot of money going into it, and there's a lot of money from the um, Infrastructure Act, and there's a lot of money from the um, Inflation Reduction Act that's going into these these spaces, um, and. Um, and you know, and, and the U.S. has a strong history of you know regulations that push innovation. I think that's that's an important part of this. You know, where we have legislative authority, I think that's something that we're looking at. Um, and um, with respect to government procurement, I agree that's a super important that's a super important issue, a super important question. I actually I know that our General Services Administration issued I think an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, and maybe Linda knows more than I do. I, I'm I'm doing this, so don't quote me here. But that that that. Um, noticed a rule that it was considering to um, to phase out pur purchasing of single-use plastics in government procurement, and so I haven't gotten the latest on that. I don't know exactly where that stands, but I think that is a really good start because you know the U.S. government is a huge, huge producer of goods and services, and if we can, you know, start there, that that in itself will I think make a dent. So. Um, and I, I don't have I don't have an exact number. I'm sorry, but uh, but there is a lot of money going into into it from through through across the U.S. government. So yeah, and we've been reading a lot about I mean, it. Even, I mean, it's an even, extraordinary amount of money. Yeah, I mean, I know the U.S. State Department. We have started the End Plastic Pollution International Collaborative that I talked about, and that's going to focus on innovation. It's going to focus on um, convening, and it's going to focus on implementing programs and projects on the ground that are the outcomes of some of the innovation work that we're doing. And and we've committed, we've committed up till now 15 million, which I know is not very much, but it's what we can do. And in this budget climate, even getting anything is a lot for the State Department. Um, and we're hoping to, to plus that up this year. Um, I can't make promises, but that's what we're hoping to do. And we're hoping to get the private sector and um, philanthropies and others to contribute as well so that we can leverage additional resources. So. Uh, and you know we're also hoping other governments come in and, and, and join Epic and our and become part of the solution here. I mean, and partly we're doing Epic because we need to start this now. This negotiation is happening um, is is happening now, but it's gonna it's gonna be finalized. We're gonna finalize the text in the end of the year. There's gonna be another six months before it's open for signature, and then it's gonna be a few years probably before it enters into force. And we can't wait that long. We've got to do things now. And so that's why we've started this public-private partnership. And I don't know, I don't, we have some of our partners here. We have someone from the Ocean Foundation, I see. We have, uh, and other partners are um, IUCN and the Aspen Institute and Serious Business. They're the hosts of this public-private partnership. 
So this is you know, something we're focusing on immediately and we're making progress immediately. We're trying to make progress immediately. Well, given the next treaty negotiations on or during Earth Week and Earth Day, we'll hope you make some progress. You, you get the last word. Um, so from the UK's point of view, we are doing quite a lot from the UK government. You know, We are trying to actually bring together not only businesses to actually focus on innovation, but also the academia side. And we're doing quite a lot in terms of putting um, some funding towards like pilots so that businesses and academia can kind of work together and find the most innovative um, solution possible. You know, we believe in, you know, putting forward policies that kind of pivots the business models to be more sustainable. As I, I said um, earlier, we have the extended producer responsibility coming into force and we're pushing that out by 2025. And Finally, um, we are quite keen that we have the private sector put a lot of finance into this. So how do we work to create business models in which finances, which can finance the circular economy and make sure that we can reduce the use of plastic is where the UK government is trying to go. And obviously, we're trying to use our mighty might of the UK government to procure green. And there's a whole um, greening government strategy that the UK is moving towards. And the UK is moving not only in terms of um, plastics, but also energy. And we're trying to be a net zero government. I think we are sad. Well, sir, you've been up. You've had your hand up first. The, the, well, I know, but the. Well, okay, the gentleman in front. What? You. Yes. Susan, stand up and sh no, the man right here. The oh, the microphone. Oh. There we go. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to be here today. I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of Emerald Planet, the Emerald Planet TV. And this goes to education. Uh, this is one of the things that you were bringing up, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, and we have, we've heard a little bit about that, but not that much, because we were looking at civil society being part of this whole process. And if we don't have the civil society either advocating for or requesting changes uh, in, in the products that they're actually uh, buying, uh, that's very difficult to do, but it's bottom-up, when bottom-up means K-12. And so how do we get the schools involved across all these uh, different nation states to really be even more serious about how we're going to advocate for the change? Because if business doesn't see the uh, business opportunity because of the clamor from the public, uh, they're going to continue to, you know, the same old, same old. So how do we uh, embed education and the rules and regulations, but also the opportunities? And thank you for being here today. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to just sort of jump in here. So Earth Day runs a, probably the largest global climate education uh, effort in the planet. We've been negotiating with UNFCCC, the EU, and just about everybody else too, um, because we really believe both from an equity point of view and an education point of view that climate change needs to be embedded in K through 12 in every subject. The science isn't that hard. Um, and our goal is innovation, uh, entrepreneurism, because we believe that business and people will probably end up doing a better job solving the climate crisis. We do in the US, Canada, Germany have federated systems. We can't get any state to agree to do anything. They have to do it themselves. And so, uh, but on plastics, um, it's, so it's the same story. Uh, you're not going to be able to integrate it. But individual schools, particularly around Earth Day, but other times during the year, they're trying to phase out single-use plastics. Is there education on the importance yet dramatic health problems and waste management problems of plastics almost nowhere. Uh, the EU is a little bit of a step ahead. Um, I don't know where Panama is, but um, I agree with you completely that education is key because we're a political democracies and they respond to people. And if you don't teach them to vote on the environment, then we'll have uh, people in office and State Departments and whatever around the world that aren't responding because they don't have to. Uh, but I'd love to, if we don't all, I know we're close to, out, we're really out of time, so um, anybody like to jump in? By the way, State's been incredibly helpful on. Just to flag that, we've been engaging with your um, right. 
FDA Education Director to see how the, um, the UK Embassy and um, we can work with you guys to kind of share the education point of view on going forward. So we're probably going to host something in our embassy in the next couple of months, right. um, bringing together champions um, from we across. We visit everybody. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, Panama, I don't know what, I can't remember off the top of my head your environmental education policies. Okay, um, education policy is a universal uh, necessity and is is understand that without education, with the knowledge of everybody, every people, it's impossible uh, the development a uh, better habit of production and consumption. And if we don't understand that the planet is just one, uh, we don't have a second planet. Uh, we can create the necessary instrument. But it's not an issue of just an instrument that uh, obligate to accomplish a law. It's the understanding, it's the conviction that is necessary to keep safe the planet uh, and conserve the human health. And education is the best way uh, to uh, de deliver this information to every uh, uh, population in the world since the primary level to uh, go ahead. And we are optimistic that in the next negotiation, we get the instrument. OK, well, I think we're out of time. I want to thank all of our uh, panelists, contestants, if you will, um, for coming today. Um, I really appreciate it, because you're all on the hot seat, and you did a more than adequate job. So thank you very much. Hi, everyone. The second panel is about to start. A couple minutes. So if you want to grab some water, come back in.
No, I don't want to. I just wanted to get everybody to sit down. So the 40,000 people, literally, she's got 40,000 online viewers. That's great. Yeah. 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 We are, Julia's going to Oh. I think you were first after right? Maddie's timing. Okay. Tell everyone I think so. So, so I said, wait, are you at the end? I thought it was at the end, but I was just said that I'm here. I think the seats are in the room. I know, I'm glad I put sunscreen on this morning. <laughs> So yeah, I'm just going to do quick intros, just name and title, if that works for everybody. Thank you. Because we are low on time. So. How much time do we have for discussion? It's supposed to be 45 minutes, so we have until 12.30-ish. So we got some time. In an hour. <laughs> and Maddie's timing. You ready to go? I'm waiting for Catherine. Oh. <laughs> hey everyone, can we take a seat? <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Hey everyone, my name is Aiden Sharon. I'm the director of N Plastic Initiatives at EarthDay.org, um, the official organizer of Earth Day since 1970. And this year our theme is Planet versus Plastic. I'm happy to be moderating this panel, Perspectives from Civil Society. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce the panel so no one will miss the eclipse because of me. <laughs> so at the end, we have Julia Cohen, the managing director of Plastic Pollution Coalition. Next to her is Dr. Jamala Jin, Science and Policy Advisor for Break Free from Plastic. Next, we have Rachel Ardvani, the Environmental Health Campaigner at Center for International Environmental Law. And finally, Dr. Louise Estevez, Associate Director of International Government Relations at Ocean Conservancy. Thank you all for being here. Take a seat. <clears throat> so, Julia, I'd like to start with you. So as we head into these negotiations, how much participation and access has civil society had with government delegations? And have you been effective at influencing delegates towards achieving cuts in plastic production? Thank you, Aiden, and Earth Day Network, and the House of Sweden, and the Swedish government. It's an honor and pleasure to be here with many of my esteemed colleagues and coalition members. Plastic Pollution Coalition is in our 15th year, we're the first organization solely devoted to the issue of plastic pollution. And the fact that we are here having a conversation about a global plastics treaty being negotiated is historic, is amazing, that in a time frame that is considered extremely fast and short to get to this position, you know, we're very proud of the work of so many of, of the groups that are part of our, our membership and our allies. That said, we have been involved in and um, advocating for since the beginning of the initial agreement to negotiate a treaty, um, trying to make sure that so many of the groups that are part of our movement, the Break Free From Plastic movement, um, that we helped create nearly six years ago now, um, in particular that represent frontline, fence line groups around the world, youth, indigenous, um, you know, and also business innovators in um, alternative materials and reuse systems, et cetera, um, are also being heard to the same extent that many of the biggest Fortune 500, 100, 
50 petrochemical industries in the world are being heard. And I think um, the question is very valid because we've been attending the negotiations. We have felt mostly not heard. Um, we may be being listened to, but I don't think we're really being heard. Um, and that said, like we don't have time. The you know panel this morning, I think, was an indication of um, that there's individual personal commitment and, and political will to a certain degree, um, but governmental political expediency and that kind of political will, um, especially in our own country in the United States, is not as strong or um, sufficient to, I think, help save humanity. <laughs> And um, the public health issues, the environmental justice issues, the human rights issues are um, totally intertwined and intersectional with the planetary crisis of climate as well. Um, plastic is oil. And that's why the Plastic Pollution Coalition nominated the High Ambition Coalition for the Earthshot Prize this year. So I'll leave it at that for now and pass it to awesome. back to you. Thank you. Jamal, now we saw a lot of press from INC3 about the fossil fuel companies having over 200 lobbyists at the negotiations, some even sitting at the table. How did that make you feel? Um, I think it's a problem. And I think, you know, honestly, it's a, it's a twofold problem because on the one hand, um, the presence of such, such so many industry lobbyists pulls down the the a number of human health considerations that we have in the treaty negotiation process and the human rights considerations that we have in the process. And it, at, at the same time, uh, you know, promotes um, a lot of sort of geopolitics and, and, and corporate profits, to be quite frank, false solutions as, as, the, um, as the way out. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about innovation today. Well, you know, there was also a, a report that just came out of Norway that said that in plastic, we have over, you know, 13,000 chemicals and 3,600 of them are as yet subject to any international regulatory framework. So as we're talking about innovation, we're talking about simplifying the chemicals and, and, and producing more sustainable plastics, and also putting the plastics in, and having a, a circular economy that includes plastics, AKA plastic circularity, we're really just talking about years upon years upon years of taking 13,000 chemicals and plastics and trying to go down to 10, years upon years upon years of circulating 13,000 toxic chemicals into a, the so-called circular economy. And meanwhile, you know, all of that innovation is taking place three to 10 miles away from black people, from indigenous people, from Latina people in this country that are being poisoned and that are suffering from the human health impacts of plastic production. There is no design out there right now for a plastic that is not environmentally persistent and that does not persist in the human body. You know what that material is called? It's called glass. It's not plastic at all. Plastic does not belong in the circular economy there be simply because the amount of time that it will take for us to, to, to actually do chemical simplification and, and similarly to innovate you know, some of these, these, these waste management, waste to energy schemes that are being promoted, it is simply going to be too long and the frontline and fence line communities that Julia mentioned do not have time to wait. And you know, towards the, the, the geopolitical aspect of this, um, I mean, I, I, I have to disagree with, respectfully, uh, the gentleman from the State Department on, on, a, couple of, on a couple of questions. Um, you know, number one, we've all seen in INC3 that there have been, you know, fossil fuel producer countries that have been kind of stalling the, the process. They've been representing, you know, a, a kind of like-minded group and, and, and lowering the ambition of the process. I would say that you know, this is one form of low ambition in the negotiations. Another form is the kind of low ambition that, that industry 
uh, introduces by promoting these kinds of false solutions in the treaty negotiation process for their economic gain. And you know, oftentimes this gives member states a very disingenuous way to look like they are pursuing high ambition in the treaty negotiations when really they're just promoting plastic circularity, chemical recycling, other false solutions that are not scientifically proven and do not put human health and human rights considerations front and foremost. If we simply protect human health and the environment using the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Toxic Substances Control Act, the bedrock environmental statutes that we have in this country to secure environmental justice and to protect fence line and frontline communities, commitments that the Biden administration has made via Executive Order 14008 and 14096, we will reduce plastic production and actually protect human health and the environment. And industry is not, their presence in these negotiations is totally undermining that. Rachel, do you agree? A hundred percent. I think, you know, as one of the panelists mentioned on the, on the previous panel, you know, industry this is a this is making them money, and if they don't if they aren't pressured to change, if they aren't required to change, why would they? Um, and I think that you know that as Jamala mentioned, they've been making money off of the suffering and and pain and and health impacts on you know communities around the world, and very specifically, Black and Brown and Indigenous communities in this country and communities across the world, including in the global south, um, who are suffering from the impacts of both production and um, and the waste management side of of plastic pollution and plastic production, um, yeah. Louise, to follow up, what strategies has civil society organizations such as Ocean Conservancy employed to mobilize diverse stakeholders in supporting actions to address plastic and plastic pollution? Thank you for the question. I think I'm going to be a little bit repetitive here because this que- I feel that this question has been addressed already. There, are, there is a need to actually have all the voices included, all the relevant stakeholders as part of these discussions. Ocean Conservancy, of course, have, has a long-standing history of actually driving processes like the International Coastal Cleanup that allows us to have this extensive network of contacts around the world uh, that we can use to actually inform partners on how these negotiations are moving forward. We also have the Global Ghost Initiative that resides actually also as part of Ocean Conservancy that we use to inform governments and fisheries and other stakeholders on how to engage in the process. Uh, But let me give you another example that I think is critical. When we actually talk about product redesign, system redesign, uh, we're talking about making plastic more uh, easily to be reused or recycled. And in that sense, waste speakers from the informal sector are quite relevant voices because they are responsible for 60%. It is estimated that they're responsible for up to 60% of the plastic, uh, collecting the plastic that is uh, ultimately recycled. So we need to make sure that they are represented as part of these discussions. We need to actually make sure that they they have a voice and that they are considered as as part of the negotiations. Uh, uh, The text right now include actually language on waste speakers, uh, but uh, it's still under brackets. Important, again, to work with stakeholders to making sure that that actually persevere over time. Let me, if if you allow me, sorry, I'm gonna go beyond the question a little bit because my expertise actually is not on plastics, my apologies. My expertise is on ocean climate plastics, uh, sorry, ocean climate uh, agenda. I I have been leading on the Friends of the Ocean Climate for multiple years now, and I want to offer a clarification because it's important for this discussion. And is that the Dubai decision from COP28 actually uh, stated that, of course, we're gonna have a transition, probably there are commitments on transitioning to more use of renewable energy, but the decision itself actually doesn't call for a phase out of fossil fuels, actually calls for a phase down of fossil fuels. And that's an important distinction because we need to take actually uh, action on, pla- on plastics to actually reduce our dependency on these fossil fuels and eventually phasing out uh, of, of, of this of these fuels and and the emissions that are related to the production, but also to the consumption of other. Rachel, how can the countries producing the most amount of plastic be forced to take the right steps towards an equitable tree for all? Because as we've discussed, it's not fair for everybody. It's not equal for us all. Yes, and just to kind of go back really quickly, it's also on the it's not equal for everybody. I also just wanted to add to what's been discussed on the petrochemical industry's influence um, that this is why conflict of interest policies within the treaty, both for the scientific bodies that could be um, 
advising the treaty, for example, on what chemicals or what criteria for chemicals to phase down or phase out, um, and also for the treaty negotiation and implementation itself are so important. So we have the example of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which basically set up a firewall for the, um, the tobacco industry's influence into the negotiations, and it has very strict guidelines on how and when governments can interact with representatives from the tobacco industry. And so, um, you know, the, the tobacco industry, of course, has very fundamental interest, uh, conflicting interests with the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control to regulate tobacco. And, and I would argue that the petrochemical, the petrochemical industry in this context has very similar fundamental conflicts of interest, and that should be recognized within this treaty. Um, but now to go back to your question, um, you know, it's not equal for all of the stakeholders that are in the room, um, to use the broad term, because you know there are there are stakeholders and there are rights holders that are in the room, but we can get into that later. Um, but for countries, of course, as well, you know, there there are countries that produce plastics and there are countries that don't produce plastics at all. And so I think, you know, I, I would highlight, you know, especially for you know from my perspective, I, I'm from the U.S. and for a country like the U.S., it's it's not just um, you know, being forced into into this, it's also a leadership opportunity for for being one of the leaders in reducing plastic pollution from the the get go, from the 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 broadest possible scope, including um, the production of plastics and their precursors and feedstocks. Um, and for this, I would get a little nerdy and argue that um, for countries to you know negotiate a treaty that's fit for purpose, which will actually reduce plastic production, sorry, plastic pollution, including production across the whole life cycle. Um, the rules of procedure of the treaty are extremely important. For those of you that have been involved in the climate space, um, I personally have not, but CL as an institution has this, you know, we've had this 30 year experience of why consensus based decision making does not work. Um, you know, we've talked about the, the, you know, the progress that we made at the last COP, but that, you know, that, that first of all, as we mentioned, was not enough, but it also took 30 years to even get there. And so that is, I, I just really want to highlight, that's why we need, you know, the rules of procedure are, do, does, do include the possibility to vote, um, but that there are some countries that are trying to undermine that. And so I really just want to emphasize that, that that is one of the reasons why uh, the ability to vote is so important in the treaty negotiations and its implementation. Thanks. I'm only to follow up if anybody wants to follow up what Rachel said. I, I just want to say that, um, yeah, I totally agree. And, and, and towards the point about how there is a perceived equity between civil society and industry in these conversations, no, there's not. Um, because to be quite frank, you know, in the United States, Within the Department of Energy, especially, there are memorandums of understanding between industry and the federal agencies right now, such that the federal agencies have been pursuing um, and looking at support for industry-sponsored technologies um, as ways to produce, as ways to address the plastics crisis. And we do not have the, you know, political inside game or or, or power to be able to engage with federal agencies on that level as civil society organizations. We do not have billions of dollars to bankroll new, techno you know, new technological solutions for federal agencies to tout. All we have are the effects on our communities. All we have are the demonstrated elevated cancer and asthma rates in our communities as the, as the advocacy for, for change. So no, there is not an equitable distribution of power between industry and, and civil society in these negotiations. And quite frankly, it makes no sense for us to be convoluted into the same groupings as, as, as stakeholders. Can you dive a little bit deeper into how frontline communities are disproportionately affected by plastic production and plastic use? For somebody that might be, this might be their first plastic panel and they're just learning what a frontline community is and what sure. plastic production means. Sure. Um, I think, you know, I could definitely give you lots of papers and statistics for this, but I'm just going to be anecdotal here. Um, so I'm from Detroit, Michigan, and uh, our entire city is um, classified as a EPA, as a brownfield by the Environmental Protection Agency. This means that our entire city is, a, is technically considered a hazardous waste site. 
Um, and the reason for that is because Detroit both um, has been impacted by plastic production as well as plastic disposal in the form of, you know, the product on the production side, we'd had Marathon oil refinery, and you know, this is where fossil fuels were taken to be refined and polymerized and transformed into plastics. Um, and then on the uh, disposal side, you know, we had an incinerator and we incinerated our waste for about 50 years or so before it was finally shut down. Now, um, both this oil refinery and incinerator dramatically um, impacted, especially the air quality in the city of Detroit. And um, that has resulted in a disproportionate rate of cancer and asthmas in the city. And, you know, any place where you have uh, fossil fuel extraction refinement taking place, you generally see elevated rates of cancers and asthma. This is true of Cancer Alley in the Gulf South. This is true of Texas. This is true of the Ohio River Valley. And this is true of Detroit, Michigan, where I'm from. And um, when the COVID-19 pandemic happened, of course, those cancers and those asthma rates manifested as comorbidities of the COVID pandemic. So that is actually why Detroit's death rate was so disproportionately high. And, you know, I can personally attest to um, having been having been affected by that and, and having, you know, really lived through something that resembled, you know, the, the, the Black Death in many ways. I mean, there were bodies piling up in the hospital hallways because we could not manage them all. That is the effect of plastic on frontline and frontline communities. That giant toxic plume of gas that you saw on the news last year when that train derailed and blew up near East Palestine, Ohio, because it was transporting polyvinyl chloride to make, you know, plastic uh, uh, paints. Like, that is the effect of transporting plastic on fence line and frontline communities. And I know how much, you know, geopolitical considerations matter here and how difficult it is to reach an agreement between hundreds of member states. But, you know, all, all I am seeing in, in, in my country and in my community where I am from is communities being blown up, communities being poisoned, and a need for a greater consideration and a centering of our human health and our human rights in this treaty negotiation process. I don't know how, how we're going to make it happen, but we need to make it happen. Thank you. Louise, Ocean Conservancy has a real interest specifically in plastic fishing gear being in the treaty. Can you unpack how that's being hijacked and hindered? And can you explain why it's such an important and not a small issue? Yes, of course. And, and as I mentioned before, Ocean Conservancy is the host of the Global Ghost Gear Initiative. So we have actually been working this, this work for years. Uh, the Global Ge uh, Go Ghost Gear Initiative informs governments, also fisheries, other stakeholders on what are the most effective measures on, on addressing uh, the issue of ghost gear. Uh, that's one point. Uh, the second point that I wanted to make is that uh, ghost gear, of course, is, a most, uh, is the deadliest form of plastic pollution in the ocean. Uh, ghost gear is designed to trap and kill marine species, and when it's lost or discarded or abandoned in the ocean, actually continues doing exactly that, entangling uh, marine species and actually killing them. So it is important that we actually include action as part of, of the agreement. Uh, also important to know that the uh, fishing gear, actions on fishing gear are kind of uh, done in, in a piecemeal approach currently. There is no global overarching framework for dealing with ghost gear. There are different processes that uh, deal with ghost gear, like UNEP, like FAO, of course, and like uh, IMO, but there is no uh, global overarching um, process. So it is important uh, uh, to actually use this opportunity to actually push for, for these issues and actually identifying the measures that would help get us to an effective solution. In terms of those effective solutions, I, I think we believe um, that there should be uh, language on, on um, design standards for fishing gear that include uh, traceability and labeling, uh, gear marking for sure, of course EPR, uh, and of course we cannot forget about um, uh, removing the ones that are already in the sea. But the agreement cannot only focus on removing the gear from the ocean, it also needs to identify those actions that allow us to prevent the gear from actually hitting the ocean. 
I'd like to pose this to everyone. Um, I'll start with you, Julia. Mm -hmm. Why is it so important that the U.S. government support a strong, binding U.N. plastics treaty, and how does it feel knowing they're not fighting to curb plastic production? Um, thank you. I, I just want to, in part of answering that question, say that you know, fishing gear, a lot of the fishing gear used to be made from natural materials, right? And not only do we need to have less plastic materials of fishing gear, because what happens to that when it's removed or even while it's being used, right? We know now the microplastics, the nanoplastics, et cetera. So it's not just about, you know, that. Similar to, you know, what Jamala was talking about in that um, there's a scientific uh, coalition working group, it, you know, and they have issued statements um, about the health impacts of plastics. And I think it's really important that their voices are uplifted, you know, and, and I don't think, you know, a level playing field is what this whole process needs. I mean, humans are part of the environment. The environment is part of us. We're not separate. So everything that is happening is a result of this embodiment of you know the the climate crisis via plastic is the result of you know business as usual we need significant systems change now and our governments need to provide those incentives and regulations to make it happen now so kind of answering your question <laughs> but i think just making the point that um you know, whether it's the, you know, we need the carrots for doing the right thing, but it needs to be non-toxic, bio-benign, not false solutions, all of that. Jamala? I guess I have two answers. Um, you know, I think the first is that we are in a global crisis of, of international humanitarian law right now, and I think everybody knows what I'm referring to when I say that the United States is contributing dramatically to that crisis. And support for human rights considerations in a strong binding UN plastics treaty would show some actual United States commitment to international humanitarian law and especially to protecting the rights of fence line and frontline communities in the United States that have suffered from these disproportionate um, impacts of toxic pollution. And my second answer is that we need to show more global leadership on environmental issues. We are extremely um, behind the curve as a, as a country. Um, we are not party to the, the Basel Convention on Transboundary Movement of Hazardous Waste. We are not party to the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. We are not party to the other multilateral environmental agreements that are needed to uh, really regulate plastic pollution and fossil fuel extraction in a in an kind of omnibus uh, format. And so for the United States to actually meaningfully engage in, um, in the UN environment program and, and, and you know, step up from its historic status as sort of an inactive observer, show some real global leadership, we need support for a strong binding UN plastics treaty. Rachel? That's a big question. Um, I guess I would start by saying, you know, there, specifically on production reduction, there is leadership from all around the world on this topic. 119 countries at INC3 supported um, measures on production reduction. Uh, many of those countries supported supply side measures on production reduction, and I would very strongly agree with the representative from the EU on the previous panel that the supply side needs to be in there at some point. Um, and I think, for me, it's going back also to the the you know the linking the domestic with the with the international. And I completely agree with the representative from the U.S. that was saying earlier that you know we need action now. Absolutely, we need action on a domestic, on an international, on a local level. Um, but you know this this administration has already made commitments to environmental justice communities on the front lines of plastic production and the front lines of plastic waste management, you know, all around this country. And, you know, you, we're not going to solve this crisis if we don't reduce plastic production. It's just, it's just not gonna, going to happen. There have been many model, models to show this. Um, and, you know, we're already seeing the levels of plastics that are in, 
you know, in the environment, in, in our communities, in our lungs, in, our, in, in placentas, um, you know, not just physical plastics, but air pollution, but microplastics, all of these things, that it's too much already. And to, to not look at this from a supply side uh, perspective is not going to solve the crisis. And the way that we are measuring how effective this treaty will be is not how many people sign on to it, how many member, sorry, member states sign on to it, um, but will it actually contribute to reducing plastic pollution, which is the title of the mandate to negotiate this treaty is end plastic pollution. So if the treaty itself, the provisions in the treaty do not contribute to that, it doesn't matter how many parties sign on to it, we're not gonna solve this crisis. And so I think that should be the true measurement about, of how effective this treaty and this negotiation is. Finally, Louise. I think it's a big question. You know, I'm a cancer biologist by training, so these health issues actually are very close to my heart. Uh, but but I, I think they have really well addressed this question. Let me just offer like an additional piece uh, as compared to actually answering that question I'm pivoting here. Um, I, I think in terms of related to stakeholders, I think it's also important to actually look at other processes, how we make sure that we're effective, we hit those ambition, uh, ambition points. I think we need to actually start looking at what's happening in other you know, international fora, as it, this relates also to impact to frontline communities, for example. There is a not perfect, but, but good overlap, for example, in terms of the impacts of climate and the impacts of plas plastic uh, pollution. Sorry. So as we push forward on identifying uh, you know, what are the best measures and the most ambitious agreement that we can get to, it's important to also keep in mind that there are other people working on similar issues that overlap with this. And we need to start probably thinking about a comprehensive approach on how to integrate these issues so we actually deliver the most ambitious uh, agreement, uh, most in fact, impact, impactful in all fronts. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple of questions, if I'm not wrong. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? <laughs> there are thousands of people watching this on a live stream right now, and a lot of them don't really understand a lot of these words and what all the details mean. What would you say to the average mom and dad or family who are watching who have no idea why plastics are bad for us? How would you say in a couple of sentences why this treaty actually needs to reduce the amount of plastic we produce and how it impacts their lives? What does it mean to the average person who's just watching this going, well, I don't eat plastic, so it's nothing to do with me? How would you communicate to them that actually this is a really important issue that they need to get involved with as well. Who would like to take it? Julia? Uh, I can start. Um, so we are all eating plastics, right? We are inhaling, we're drinking, we're breathing. Um, a credit card's worth per week is the estimate, right? And plastics are made with all kinds of chemicals that cause various forms of cancer, obesity, ADHD, a long list. Um, so not only is it directly impacting individuals, but plastics production impacts in incredibly communities who live next to the facilities, whether it's the extraction of 90, 95, 99% of plastics are made from fossil fuels. So whether it's the extraction of oil or the processing plants or the waste management plants, it's not just you using or not using plastic in your daily life. So it's important to make your own individual personal behavior changes because we vote with our dollars. You know, as we heard earlier, you know, companies are, you know, trying out piloting things and saying that the consumers don't want them, whether it's refill, reuse systems, different kinds of packaging, et cetera. I don't think that's true. I think the advertising dollars put behind new systems, new materials, et cetera, need to be the equivalent of what they have historically to get us to the position we're in. Um, but so it's important for individuals to recognize that they're personal behavior, what they choose to buy, don't buy, refuse single-use plastic in the first place, bring your own bags, your own bottles, your own utensils, et cetera, is important, but that you need to connect the dots to the bigger picture and to inter local policies, federal policies, and international treaties help play a role in all of that. So. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, I would also add, completely agree with everything that Julia is saying, and, and for me, something that really, really sits heavy with me is the health impact, because I completely agree we need to you know, vote with our dollars, get involved in, in, in the local, in the national, and in the international like, politics side of it. But for plastics, I think you know, 
the industry has done a really good job of making us all think that plastics are inert um, and think that they're this harmless material. And as Jamala said, this study came out that there's 16,000 chemicals in plastics. And in that study, it also goes into how plastics affect fertility. And on the other side, plastics are also one of the, the, the there are studies that show that it, plastics with the expansion plans of the of the industry could take up to a third of our carbon budget by by 2050. And so as a young person that's in this work, that is something that really, really hits home with me. You know, it's it's not just about, you know, it's about our future. And obviously these impacts are also hardest hitting on the people that are living next to these plants, but it is affecting every single one of us. You know, it's impo it, the way the world is right now, it's impossible to avoid plastics in our lives. And every time you interact with plastics, you're interacting with hundreds, thousands of those 16,000 chemicals in plastics, 10,000 of which we don't even know any data about. So that is the part that I think I, I, I like to say to people when I'm talking about um, plastics is, is really just like, We've we've been we've been frankly lied to about the lack of health impacts in plastics. There there are we don't even know the full range of, of the impacts that we are interacting with every time we interact with plastics. Yeah, totally agree. Um, you know, I guess the way that I phrase it sometimes is, you know, we are oft we talk a lot in our society about say breast cancer awareness, but in many cases, you know, we're really talking about plastics awareness because we're talking about, you know, the, the disease, but the disease is, is so often, especially in frontline communities, the outcomes of those years upon years of, of sustained toxic exposures via plastics. You know, when you buy clothes as many you know people of my generation do from places like Shein and Fashion Nova and these fast fashion companies if you look at the actual constituent uh, molecules and in, in those in those products it's polyurethane polyethylene polyester it is all plastics and 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 indeed you know those are toxic chemicals laying right on your skin. I guarantee you that, you know, half the people in this room right now <laughs> have toxic chemicals directly contacting your skin via um, this, you know, what Rachel is talking about, this, this trading of, you know, human health protections and human environment protect and, or, and, and protections for the environment for convenience and, and profits, which is really what the story of plastics is, you know, that and the story of racism in America and the world. How do I talk about these issues? I, when you ask that question, I think about my kids. You know, how do I explain to them that it is important that they take action also to contribute to the problem? I think it's important they understand that there are impacts related to plastics, um, probably related to health, probably related to ecosystems, probably related to the livelihood of people who rely on these uh, resources in the ocean for their subsistence. There are many touch points that actually can really help justify action. Uh, just also wanted to mention that uh, Ocean Conservancy um, just recently released a report that shows that um, humans consume up to 3.8 million pieces of microplastic each year, up to 3.8 million, and that microplastics can be found pretty much in every single protein that we actually tested, from red beets to seafood to tofu. So, you know, taking action on, on these issues is critically important, but it's not just uh, on the health. Of course, health is, is a critical issue, but it's also, you know, on the environment, the populations that depend on the ocean for their livelihoods, they need to actually have an ocean that produces for them. It's also on climate, uh, as it was mentioned before. Production of plastic actually significantly contributes to the emissions issues. Uh, actually, Ocean Conservancy research shows that if we reduce single-use plastic by 50% by 2050, we could actually actually be cutting emission reduction by 11 billion tons of CO2 equivalent emissions. So it's not a minor point. And, and that's why I think it's important to actually highlight all these touch points, especially when you talk to the kids, educate them on why it's important. Everyone can actually have an impact, but also inform citizens to actually engage with their decision makers and actually talk to them. Why do we need to take action? We need to take action because it's important directly to us. It impacts us directly. It also impacts the people who depend on these resources. So we should all actually take action on the issues. 
no one has any other questions. Oh, gentleman up front here. Hi, uh, I just have a comment rather. Uh, my name is David, I'm from the Embassy of Eritrea. And uh, thank you for this wonderful, wonderful session. And it has been very, very enlightening. Uh, Eritrea was one of uh, the first countries in Africa to ban uh, plastic bags. So that's over 23, 24 years ago. But it comes with a lot of challenge. Um, a lot of challenge in the sense both for um, economic enforcement, alternatives, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but one thing that I want to make comments is just I don't want to go over all the stuff that has been uh, discussed here because it's been wonderfully enlightening. Um, what we talked about earlier, uh, Rob, as uh, stakeholders, we need to involve all the stakeholders. And I appreciate um, uh, some of the uh, communities that we've been discussing. Uh, but the Global South, the main victims of countries are not here. I was wondering, like, I was look, trying to look around. I'm the only one from Africa, I guess, here. Ho I, I hope somebody's here. But these are the things that we need to really concentrate and, and work on. And, and, and that's all I want to say. So we all need to work together, and the stakeholders uh, are, are very, very important, their involvement. Without that, all this that has been said uh, is not going to be achieved. And Air Chair, for instance, I know the plastic ban, plastic ban was banned. I just came uh, from there, and there has been a discussion of talk, talking about um, uh, banning plastic bottles. But then what do you do? How do you, I mean, the indigenous way of weaves and potteries and stuff, all that is destroyed. It's all gone. Everything is replaced with modern technology of plastics. And how, do, how are people going to sustain, live their life? So uh, uh, thank you for um, this wonderful session for all the presenters, previous and the current. And uh, I'd like to see more of this. Thank you. Thank you. I think the woman at the end there. Yeah. I'm Carol Ortuno. I'm, and um, I, I would like to focus um, as a consumer, because plastic is comfort for all the consumers. So uh, we we are. Um, I'm not gonna um, say anything about the communities that is in danger because it's sens sens sensitivity for me. And uh, we are talking about um, about the plastic life cycle all the time. I I, I heard about the, this. It's an issue. But uh, the mismanage of plastic is other, another issue, and it's in, in, the, in the hands of the consumers, too. And not only the, uh, we, we, we have to, to look up to the supplier chain, the value change, uh, chain, and I think uh, is uh, what you think about uh, not only work in uh, ex extended producer responsibility, uh, and uh, think about extended consumer responsibility. Because this mismanage and the, the, the failed waste management is because we, uh, as a consumers, didn't put in, a, in the right uh, uh, way. Or we, we, cho uh, we choose to, to buy in chain or, or another uh, um, uh, store. Or uh, we choose to consume uh, uh, plastic instead of other uh, of, of other materials. What do you think about that? I, I'll take a try. Uh, these guys are the experts, but I'll take a try. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the big, biggest issues that we have been championing, as many others, uh, is, is product redesign. You know how we actually think about plastic in a better way. Uh, uh, the use needs to change, how we manage plastics needs to change, but that of that change is actually uh, making sure that plastics are more easy to reuse and recycle. Uh, and that actually does not always fall on, on, on their, the consumer. Actually, it is, from our perspective, uh, the producer actually has a big responsibility there, guaranteeing that the systems are in place 
So the consumer can take advantage of them are actually actually using them for reuse and recycling. Uh, so, but, but the other important thing, as you mentioned, you know, behavior is important. We are not going to recycle our way out of this issue. So, you know, it is important that we take action on multiple fronts. Uh, but but I, I truly believe that producers have a big role here to guaranteeing that the systems are in place to easier reuse and, and, uh, and recycling uh, and promoting the change in, you know, in better innovation and design for, for future products that do not have the same impact. I would just say very briefly, um, one thing I, I would add to that is um, on the chemical composition side, um, I think it's one thing to have, I completely agree, you know, we have to have the right systems in place to be able to take advantage of them, but also um, someone on the earlier panel was mentioning, right, that only five to eight percent of plastics can actually be recycled because of their chemical composition, and so it's it's one thing to to have the systems, and then it's another thing to actually have the recycling take place, and so I think that's again on the on the, the producer side of things, um, which is why the the treaty is so important on regulating the chemicals that are in plastics too. Because you know we've been told for for many many years that recycling is is the way to to solve this problem, but clearly it's not actually um, you know be, being recycled. I I agree. Um, I I think consumer behavior tends to be <clears throat> excuse me driven the most by convenience and towards that end um, you know we, we need to simply make it more convenient for non-toxic reuse to be the you know the the, the the primary framework by which we do packaging by which we do you know a lot of things in our economy um, and and uh, kind of to piggyback a little bit on what Rachel was saying about um, chemicals, I, you know, I think one thing that this treaty can be very effective in codifying is consumer protection in this realm, um, because there are so many uh, chemicals in in plastic. You know, and because, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, of that, you know, sixteen thousand, there's thirty six hundred of them that are as yet not even you know subject to any regulation. We don't even really understand them. Um, it seems like we need a kind of disclosure framework. We, we need companies uh, that are producing and, and refining plastics to disclose the polymers, disclose the chemicals, um, and to be transparent and report and, 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 and monitor on, on progress towards you know chemical simplification or whatever it is that they're doing. Um, because you know that I think is is very critical for protecting consumers from the uh, potential toxic exposures from plastic, and um, you know I we've 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 said this uh, at least break free, in plastic, break free from plastic and CL um, to the State Department before, but you know if there is indeed support for um, demand side measures for production reduction, then I think a disclosure framework for polymers and chemicals of concern is a, should be a starting point for that conversation. And just to add, I think the incentives for new design, new materials, whether it's seaweed, mushroom mycelium, the algae replacements that are bio-benign, and I don't even think we would want to even call them pl plastics. They need to be called something else. Um, there are companies that are members of our coalition. We have, uh, you know, almost 700 business members in the Plastic Pollution Coalition, and they are the refillable, reusable, new material, new design kinds of companies. They need the same kind of support that the petrochemical industry has gotten for decades, and our tax dollars should be supporting the exponential scaling of those kinds of companies and businesses and products. Um, that are in line with the scientific coalition, um, that are in line with, you know, the human rights and environmental justice, um, you know, statements and, and points that we've made here as well. And I think that that is a huge part of how you improve the systems. Right now, those are externalized costs for companies put on consumers and local communities to deal with the health impacts, the waste management, et cetera. And if a true life cycle assessment was ever done to include those costs, 
um, the cost of human fertility going to zero in the next few decades, I think is you know more than trillions. It's more than all of our economies, right? So it is the future of humanity. Thank you, and thank you all for coming and participating in the panel. I really appreciate it, and thank you to House of Sweden for hosting, and happy Earth Month. That's